Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So who are you? If I took this microphone, walked up and down the aisles, and asked you the question, who are you? What would you say? It sounds like a simple question, but it isn't really. For example, if someone said to me, who are you? I might say, I'm Roxanne Brundle. That's just my name. I might say, I'm the associate pastor at St. George but that's what I do. I might say, I'm a Canadian. Well, that's where I live or that's where I was born. I could say I'm an awesome tennis player, but that's a wish. So who am I? Well, I'm five feet, nine inches tall without heels. I have blue eyes, brown, lightly streaked hair, and I'm reasonably attractive. But my physical dimensions and my appearance aren't me either. Because let's face it, I can change my hair, I can lose a leg in an accident, I can get a heart transplant, and I would still be me. So what makes me me? What makes you, you? Now the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, to recognize no man according to the flesh but we all do it. Who are you talking about? Well, you, you know, you know, the tall one. You know, you know, the one that's kind of short. You know, the stocky one. You know, the slender one. Or by what they do. I'm talking about the lawyer. You know, the doctor. You know, the financial planner. You know, the landscaper. Somehow we talk as if we believe that who we are is determined by how we look or what we do. Now we all know you can't judge a book by its cover, a movie by its title, or a person by their looks. We've all read fairy tales. Remember the characters in Beauty and the Beast? The Beast was hideous and ugly. And Disney's Gaston was confident, popular, and handsome. But their outward appearance told us nothing about who they were. At the end of the tale, the beast was really a prince, and Gaston was really a beast. We all know about the ugly duckling that turned into a swan. And in scripture, we are constantly reminded to beware of the enemy who may appear as a sheep in wolf's clothing, or as an angel of light instead of the prince of darkness. Our true identity is not linked to our outward appearance. Think about it. Who would ever thought that the shepherd boy would stand taller than Goliath? Who would have thought three Jews would burn brighter than the flames in a Babylonian furnace? And who would have thought a poor carpenter from Nazareth would turn out to be the savior of the world? So how we look doesn't tell us who we are. Okay, so what about what we do? Does what we do determine who we are? Or rather, does who we are determine what we do? I think who you are determines what you do. More importantly, who you think you are determines what you do. Now, Neil Anderson, in his book, Victory Over Darkness, has a wonderful illustration. He says, imagine a macho college guy. He calls him Biff. Biff is into the whole college scene. He sees himself as a skin wrap package of salivary glands, taste buds, and sex drive. So what does he do with his time? He eats and he chases girls. In fact, he chases anything in a skirt. But he has a very special gleam in his eye for a girl named Susie. One day, Biff was chasing Susie around the campus, and the track coach saw him. 
And the track coach said, this guy can run. When the coach finally caught up to him, he said, come on, Biff, how about join the track team? Biff says, no way, I'm busy. But the coach was like a dog with a bone, and he wouldn't give up. So Biff reluctantly agreed to come to a practice. So Biff started working out with the track team, and he discovered he was a good runner. He changed his eating and sleeping habits, and his skills improved. In fact, he started winning races. And at one point, a big race was coming. He came early. He stretched. He warmed up. Then a few minutes before the race, guess who shows up? Susie. Susie shows up and she's got this plate with an apple pie loaded with ice cream. And she says to Biff, I missed you, Biff. You know what? Come with me and I will give you this pie and lots more. No way, Susie, Biff answered. Why not? Susie pouted. Biff said, because I'm a runner. Neil Anderson in the story tells us it's really important who you think you are. What was the different about Biff? What happened to his drives? What happened to his hormones? They were still there. He was the same guy who could still eat three burgers, two bags of fries, and a quart of Pepsi. And he still really liked Susie, but he no longer saw himself as a bundle of physical urges. He saw himself as a runner. And as Neil Anderson so clearly states, who you understand yourself to be is really important. So who are you? The world tells us that our identity, our worth, can be found in the external, the surface things. And for one reason or another, we believe it. Too often, we allow the world to tell us that our identity, our worth, our success is linked to good looks, to having the right friends, to having the right job, and to having the right salary. Why do we as Christians go to the world for our identity? Why? Listen to the scripture, Galatians 3, 26. You are sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Galatians 4, starting at 5. To redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So, who are you? According to God, if you're a believer, you're a child of God. You're a son, you're a daughter of the Most High God. You're a kid of the King. In God's kingdom, your wholeness, your value, your worth is never based on what you look like. It's never based on what you've done. It's never based on what you have. Your value, your worth is because of who you are. Who are you? A child of God. So let's remember in the very beginning, God made man fully alive, physically and spiritually. God created man, why? To be in union with him, to have conversation with him, to have a loving relationship with him. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and experienced a spiritual death. Their union with God was severed. They were set apart. And because of the fall, we too are born physically alive, but spiritually dead. Thanks to the cross, it all changed with Jesus. It all changed with Jesus. We are no longer slaves. We are free. When we come face to face with the understanding that Jesus is God's son, that Jesus 
is our Lord and Savior, we are born again. We are born again. Please remember the moment, the very moment you confess your sins before God, the very moment you acknowledge your need of Jesus, you are spiritually reborn. You became spiritually alive in Christ. Contrary to what most Christians believe, eternal life, as David so often says, is not something you get when you die. It's something you have right now if you are a believer. The only thing that changes when you die is you exchange your old earthbound body for a new one. Salvation is not a future reality. It's a present transformation. So who are you? If you at one point in your life said yes to Jesus, you are a kid of the king. You are a kid of the king. Understanding your true identity is really important. Let's face it. If Biff didn't see himself as a runner, he would have let Susie sidetrack him before an important race. And if you remember the Samaritan woman we met last week, if she didn't see herself as Jesus did, as someone important, as someone valued, as someone loved, she would never have had the courage to tell others about Jesus. She would have let the scowls and disappointment of the world keep her from the abundant life God was calling her to. People, this is really important. If you look to the world for your worth, for your value, for your identity, you will never have enough. You will never be enough. And you will never do enough. However, if you see yourself as a child of God, spiritually alive, you will live in victory and freedom. You will experience, slowly but surely, the abundant life Jesus is calling you to. You are saints because God called you. You have part of those stars. Look outside tonight, look at them and go, you know those stars? I have a part of those stars because I'm a joint heir with Christ. That means whatever is true of Christ is true of you. That means that you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, children of God, joint heirs with Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. These truths can't be bought, they can't be earned, but they are guaranteed simply when you say yes to Jesus. You have to remember these truths. Constantly remind yourself that you are a child of God because the world is constantly going to remind you that you are worthless and nothing. Remember, you are loved. You are valuable. You are important. Why? Because you are a child of God. Please remember that Satan and the world will constantly try to convince you that you haven't done enough, that you are not enough, and that you will never be enough. In fact, Satan will often put in your mind a sense that you are unworthy and unacceptable, and there is no way that you can come to the throne of God. Is that who you are? No, that is not. You are a saint whom God has declared righteous. Why? Because when he sees you, he sees Jesus. And it is because of Jesus that we are declared righteous. Remember, Satan can do nothing about our eternity. Okay, that was sealed the moment you said yes to Jesus. But he can get you. He can say, you're not going to amount to anything. Don't listen to him. Remember, believing the truth shall set us free. Remember, believing the truth shall set us free. The Apostle Paul often talks about taking every thought captive. And what that really means is that when you get something in your brain that doesn't make sense, you look at it and you say, is this truth or is this a lie? 
So when you hear after you've made a mistake, you're never going to amount to anything, Roxanne. You pull it out and you say, that's a lie. I'm a child of God. Make sure you reject the lies of the enemy. Who are we? We are children of God. We are accepted. We have been bought with a price and belong to God. We are complete in Christ. We have direct access to God. Who are we? We are secure. We are confident that God will complete the good work he started in us. We are born of God, and evil cannot touch us. We are significant. We have been chosen. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The more you believe it, the more you reaffirm it, the more your behavior will reflect your true identity. Biff never knew he was a runner till he started running. Now, this might sound kind of easy. You go, all right, this is good. But surely our sins and failings must affect our identity in Christ. So what about sin? What happens to our relationship with God when we sin? Can we lose our place in God's family? Let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about our earthly fathers. When I was born, physically, I had a father. His name was Glenn Stewart. As his daughter, I had his DNA. I like to say I had his blood coursing through my veins. There was nothing I could do to change that. But there was something I could do to change the way we reacted. From the moment I was born, I could communicate in two different ways. I could communicate to enhance, or I can communicate to malign my relationship with my father. My blood relationship with my father never changed. But my relationship with him, as far as how we spoke, as far as how we related, was often due to how much time I spent with him. So similarly, when I was born, again, I became a member of God's family. God is my father. I enjoy a relationship with him through the precious blood of Jesus. God chose me. I did nothing to warrant God's acceptance, but I am related to God. And nothing can change that blood relationship. Paul asks in Romans, who can separate us from the love of God? And he answers, no created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus. So, guys, this is good news. This is good news. This is good news. Everybody should be jumping up. This is good news because we don't have to feverishly cling to our salvation. We don't have to wonder after a sin, does God love me any less? Am I going to lose God's love? Am I out of the family? God's love will always, 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 always be there. He will hold you in the palm of his hand. And like it or not, once spiritually reborn, we are his forever. We can never lose his love, but conversely, we can never escape his love. Our relationship with God is forever settled when we were born into his family. Am I a child of God? If I said yes to Jesus, I am a child of God forever. However, the harmony of my relationship, how God and I interact, is based on obedience, is based on a willingness of spending time with God. When we ignore God, when we don't follow his lead, when we sin, the harmony of our relationship is disturbed. Remember, thanks to the cross, our eternity is sealed. But the day-to-day -day living can either be victory or defeat. We should strive to obey God, not because we are afraid of losing love, but because we realize the depth of his love. We can't be any more a child of God than when we were first born. However, by worshiping God, spending time in his presence, we can experience that abundant life that Jesus was talking about. It will allow us to be all that we were meant to be. I want to leave you with this thought. David Hawking once said that some of the world's most miserable people are Christians who would rather not be part of God's family. 
Those are the people in the palm trying to jump out. Because the problem is our inheritance is eternal. And once reborn, our spiritual self can never be fully content outside the will of God. Let us rejoice in our identity every single day. We are beloved, we are valued, we are worth a lot. I sometimes think about that parable, that kingdom parable, where it talks about a merchant in search of a fine pearl that goes and, and sees something very valuable and sells all. And we all think about that as us finding the good news. But I like to think about it as God saying, Jim, you're worth everything, uh, even my son. That's what Jesus is saying to each one of us. You're worth everything, even my son. Let us rejoice in that identity and let us strive to be all that God is calling us to be. Let us pray. Precious God, we thank you for the truth. Help us to accept it and help us to live as if we know it. In Jesus' name. Amen.